Hello there, welcome back. So far, we've been on a journey trying to understand the fundamentals of how CPUs and computers work. I'm a programmer, and the computer itself has always been like a black box that I was insulated against, writing my code in a high level language like C. I didn't need to know about registers or care much about where my code has been put in RAM, although I've always had a deep fascination with how things work at a low level, and that's what we're looking at in these videos. I'm trying to present technical information, but in a straightforward way, just like you'd find in a 1980s computer manual. Nothing's been dumbed down, but instead I'm trying to explain it clearly enough that most people should be able to follow along. What you're looking at here is a simulation of an MOS 6502 CPU. It's not your typical emulator though. Instead of emulating bytes of code, the actual electronic signals of the chip have been simulated. If we could somehow see inside our chips, this is what we'd be looking at. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Like many people, I have a collection of old computers and I've always wanted to do something more than loading a game off an SD card. You know, if I want to play some old games, I can just load up an emulator. There's nothing too special about it. These old computers aren't novelty games devices to me. I don't actually have many memories of spending hours playing games on my old computers. Instead I spent ages typing in basic listings and trying to figure out what the machine itself was doing. You can get so much more out of a machine I think if you start trying to write code on it. It stops it being this passive device like a TV where you just consume stuff made by someone else and instead you're now in control of it creating something. So what next then? Well let's level up our skills from last time and increase the complexity. In the 80s, there were two main competing CPUs. There was the Z80, made by Zilog, which was used in the ZX Spectrum liner machines, and my RC2014. And then there's the 6502, made by MOS Technology, which was used in things like the Apple II and the C64. So let's take the Pepsi challenge, as it were, and have a look at what a 6502 system is like, and use it to create some more visually interesting programs. So far I've done a lot of Z80, and it's mostly been ASCII based, which is nice and everything, but I now want to make something that actually looks quite pretty. I'm not done with the Z80 though, we'll come back to it in the future. I've got a Spectrum next, and I need to do something with that. And also there's the game of life that I need to optimise. What I want to show you today is the bigger brother to my first ever computer. And conveniently, it's got 6502 inside it. This video is going to be an overview of the machine and things I've discovered and learnt whilst writing code on it for the past two weeks. So, get comfy, we're going back to 1981 where computers were mystical devices that filled rooms, we hadn't yet invented flux capacitors, everyone wore horrible flared trousers, beige was the in colour, all our cows were mad and so were some women that ran the country. It was a bit like today actually. The UK government though decided we all needed to know what computers were, and they are big plans. Plans that for once actually paid off. This was a government IT project that actually succeeded. You don't see those very often. This one was pretty special. So let's go play with a BBC Micro. This isn't going to be a history video. I'm not that kind of place. Instead, we're technical. We're going to write some code and poke at the hardware, but I do need to cover some basics first, especially since this machine wasn't well known outside the UK. It's so British that the keyword colour is actually spelt with a U like it should be, and the casing is the same colour as a cup of tea. It's not faded and gone weird over the years, that's actually the colour it was made. So, back in the 80s, the BBC started something called the Computer Literacy Project, a series of TV programmes and literature with the aim of teaching the British public all about these newfangled computers that were predicted to slowly take over our lives. To do this, they needed a computer specifically for the purpose, and after some fussing and debate, the BBC Micro from Acorn was the end result. There's been lots of documentaries and quite entertaining TV programmes made about this. You should go and find them. As a kid who grew up in the 80s, I had no idea any of this stuff was going on. I just thought computers were cool, and that there were things people used, like cars or TVs. I didn't know that they were like this new thing that a large percentage of the population didn't understand. To me, they seemed quite logical but I remember my parents looking at what I was doing on my computer and not understanding a single thing that was going on. It was cool, it was like my thing. The BBC Micro is solidly built from beige and black plastic with real keys. You can see the machine was clearly designed to withstand 10 year olds hammering away on the keyboards in classrooms, and we really did give them some stick. Schools would often have at least one, maybe, if it was a good school, an entire room with as many as 20. Remember, this is the 1980s. We were still getting used to colour TV. 
having some sort of interactive TV computer thing was science fiction. As it was designed to be an educational machine for people to experiment with, it featured many things that other micros at the time lacked, and we're going to look at some of those things now. For the time, the machine had a fairly modest but capable set of specs. Due to its internal design, the 2 MHz CPU could quite easily keep pace with the Z80, running at more than twice the speed. The main interesting bit though, and proof that this was really designed for people to like, experiment and plug things into, was the number of expansion ports on it. You see, your typical micro of the time had the usual video and I/O and controller ports, so some way to get data in and out, a way to see what the machine was doing, and some kind of extension of the CPU's bus for extra hardware, which was mostly just used for plugging in like a printer, or maybe a joystick connector, or a hard disk, or a floppy disk. The BBC had these, but then more. Having just one I.O. port wasn't enough, they added three. One of those was designed so that other CPUs could be connected to the machine. You could have like a second processor attached to it. Another port operated very much like the GPIO pins of a Raspberry Pi. And if that wasn't enough, you were encouraged to open it up and swap out the ROM chips inside. In a time where floppy disks didn't have much data and load times were important, they often sold software on ROM chips. So you'd buy like a word processor, you'd have to open the machine up and put a chip inside it. You see, back then in the 80s, we didn't know that there was like technical people and non-technical people. Everyone was treated the same, so you weren't an end user with restricted privileges or a technical user with admin rights. You just bought a computer and if you needed to learn how to program, you learned how to program. The first thing the manual of the BBC Macro does, after telling you how to plug it in and turn it on and tune in your TV, is it tells you to experiment with some commands to see what's going on. To make this video easier to watch, I'm mostly going to use an emulator on my PC. These machines are quite simple to buy today's comparison, and they're really easy to emulate now. That's a thing that back in the 80s would have surprised anybody. Now that we know some technical specs about the machine, let's just look at its screen, because that's quite unique as well. Video on 8-bit machines was always a bit of a minefield. Most 8-bit computers have a screen that operates in a few simple modes. There might be a 40-column text mode that does text really nicely and nothing else. Or there might be some graphics mode where you can do colour, but you're trading off the number of colours against the number of pixels. The BBC is a bit different, it's got seven video modes. The first six are the usual kind of thing where there's graphics and text with varying colours and different sizes of text and graphics. However, there's a seventh mode that we can use, and this one's really unique. Now, you need to understand that this computer is called the BBC Micro, not by mistake. It was created for the BBC, the actual broadcasting corporation, and they wanted to use it in live TV broadcasts, which means it had to be compatible with broadcast equipment. They built two things into it. The first was dedicated RGB video. At this time, other machines just had an RF box, or at best, composite video, that was probably fuzzy with a load of dot crawl and just wouldn't be suitable for broadcasting on actual primetime TV. So the BBC company, wanted solid, crisp, quality, broadcast quality RGB graphics. So that was built into it. I'm using this to display my BBC on a monitor using an RGB to HDMI converter. The image is really crisp. There's no weird artifacts at all. The second thing that they put in it was an SAA 5050 teletext chip that could generate a whole screen of text using 1K of RAM. If you didn't know what teletext is, it was an over-the-air information service that broadcast pages of text in the spare blanking lines at the bottom of the TV signal. It was a major thing back in the 80s and 90s. And that was decoded by circuitry inside the TV. It's the same circuitry, or thereabouts, that is inside the BBC Micro. So you can see that this machine was designed not just for classrooms to give to their kids to teach them something about computers, it was designed to be a piece of broadcast hardware as well, used in a TV studio. When you turn a BBC Micro on, the first thing you'll see is a flashing cursor. And like most machines of the time, you're staring at a basic interpreter. It's just how these machines worked. We hadn't yet invented graphical interfaces, and the machines weren't capable enough anyway. This has to be the most powerful dialect of BASIC I've ever seen though. In fact, it still exists today in various forms. At the time, most home micros had a basic interpreter, and it didn't really do much, it was mostly just a way of getting code into the machine. 
and even interacting with the hardware was pretty difficult because you could only use the standard basic commands. However, on the BBC there's a full blown operating system that deals with the disk drive, display, I.O., interrupts, everything. You see, every time the V-blank signal fires, the whole system is interrupted and background tasks are run. So it might check whether the printer needs more data, or it might check if the user's pressed any keys. There's stuff going on as well as your code. Some of the commands that we type in are merely human-friendly ways of accessing the operating system directly. For example, there's ways of setting up flashing text, and then you can type in other commands that tell the operating system to change the speed of the flashing text. This is also how you draw on the screen. There's a move and a plot command, and I can use that to draw some pretty nice patterns. But really, all those commands are doing is calling operating system functions to tell the video chip what to do. While trying to learn how the graphics system worked, I kept coming across instructions telling me just to print characters on the screen, and I'm thinking, but I want to draw lines, not print characters. What it turns out is that the video hardware actually just understands control codes, kind of like how ASCII control codes in the RC2014 make it do colours. These ones make it draw lines. There is a bitmap display hiding in RAM, and you can go and poke at it, but the manual strongly recommends you don't. Because the thing is, the BBC isn't just like one type of computer, it was a whole family. And internally, some of them were very different to each other. And if you're using the external add-on processors, they work differently, didn't have access to the same types of memory. So the operating system is one way that glues everything together. And they're very keen on you using it. However, if you throw all that out the window, you can actually poke at the machine directly. And we'll do some of that later on. To be able to do that low-level poking, you need to escape out of BASIC. Now, this is another great feature of the BBC. It had an inline assembler. You could freely mix assembly code and BASIC in the same program. The BASIC interpreter would then assemble the code for you. It would either then run it, or it would allow you to save that machine code to disk, and then that's what you could load up again without having to recompile it. Nothing else offered this. In other BASICs, the poor user had to hand assemble their code separately on paper and then force the hex values into RAM, either using a short loader program or spending hours typing out pages and pages of hex data. If you remember in the late 80s when basic typing listings stopped being understandable, they suddenly changed into just pages of like data statements that you had to type in. Well, on a BBC, you would actually type in assembly language and it would make sense. So now I've mentioned assembly, I think we need to explore that and see how it compares to Z80. Let's have a look. I'm far from being a skilled assembly programmer, I've not been doing it that long. Although I do feel more confident writing assembly than I do basic, and I've got a decent understanding of what's going on. Let's compare Z80 and 6502. So as you can see, the fundamental difference is the Z80 is rammed full of registers and has loads of commands. The 6502 on the other hand has um, three registers and that's it? How are we supposed to write code with that? There's not enough there. I'm used to writing code where I stick things in registers and keep it for like multiple lines of code. On the 6502, you've got an accumulator for adding up numbers, and then two registers that are mostly used for indexing, and a part of the addressing routines. And you can't just put a piece of data in it and hope it's there when you come back to it later on. Fortunately for our sanity, the engineers at MOS weren't completely bonkers. I mean, they must have been a little bit. When this CPU was being developed in the 70s, they hand drew the circuitry of the chip. There weren't any computers yet to do it for them, obviously. The chip has the concept of paging, where the CPU's address range is split into banks of 256 bytes. The first bank was called zero page, and the CPU has special operations to work with that section of RAM, as if it was internal. All the books on 6502 assembly tell you to use zero page for most things because the instructions run incredibly quick. They're two bytes long usually, and they can be completed in like two or three clock cycles. Compared to Z80 where some of its instructions could take up to 20 cycles to complete. Now even though the BBC has a built in assembler, I'm not going to subject myself to using it. I like retro computers, I don't much like their limited development systems. So we're going to use what is pretty much my standard environment now. It's a PC running Windows, Visual Studio Code, and whichever compiler toolchain I need to use running under Windows subsystems for Linux. So in this case, I found a 6502 compiler that specifically is made for the BBC, 
and it will create a disk image for me, which I can then run through the emulator. What you're looking at is an example. I found this in a book, and after converting it to pure assembly, I managed to make it work. It's not that exciting, but compared to moving at signs, we're onto a whole new level of possibilities now. This is pretty cool. I find the best way to learn a new system, though, isn't to type in other people's code, but to write my own. My Hello World equivalent is to write a program that has a nested loop, does some meaningful process using RAM, so we're not just calculating numbers, I want to produce something nice on the screen, and the output needs to be more exciting than a number or a line of text. I teach people how to program, and the first steps are always these quite boring, dry, print out your name, or ask for two numbers and add them and print out the answers. I've done so much of that in my life now, I want to jump into the fancy graphics bit. What I did was I found the BBC Micro OWL logo and I spent quite a while converting it into screen control codes and then wrote this little program that prints it on the screen. All it does is loop through the grid of image data, printing it to the screen sequentially. If you look at the data you can even see the carriage returns and line feeds at the end of it. It took me a while to figure this out but in doing it I've learned how to do looping, I've learned how to access RAM, I've understood more about what the CPU is supposed to be used for and kind of the philosophy behind how they want you to code on it and I now feel a bit more confident that I can produce something else and that's where we're going next. So what I've just shown you is a bit of an overview of the computer and what I've managed to make it do so far. This seems like a good place to stop the video before we start getting too technical again. In the next video I want to go through writing a game. The BBC isn't a very sophisticated machine, it doesn't have fantastic high resolution graphics, so I think it's within my capabilities of what I can create. And I'm thinking it might be nice to make something like Tetris, or maybe Flappy Bird, at least. Something where I don't have to focus too much on thinking up new gameplay, I can just focus solely on creating a game. I'm obviously going to do it completely in assembly, so if this whole retro programming and retro computer thing sounds fun, subscribe for some more. If you found me randomly, you should subscribe anyway, because you might not find this channel again. Press the thumbs up button too. I want to train YouTube to show these videos to other people like you so that they can enjoy them. So until next time, goodbye.